What's so funny? I'll, I'll tell you in a minute. First, let's drink. Me from my glass, and you from yours. <laughs> you guessed wrong. You only think I guessed wrong. That's what's so funny. I switched glasses when your back was turned. Ha <laughs> ha, you fool. You fell victim to one of the classic blunders. The most famous is never get involved in a land war in Asia. But only slightly less well known is this. Never go in against a Sicilian when death is on the line. <laughs> Never get involved in a land war in Asia. This is one of the classic historical truisms, or as we'll investigate in this episode, perhaps one of the classic historical myths. What goes hand in hand with this never get involved in a land war in Asia is never invade Russia in the winter. Now, I've seen this on T-shirts. I've seen it on Internet memes. I've seen it on Twitter. Okay, this is what I do. I have friends who wear Never Invade Russia in the winter t-shirts. And I look for history memes, but that's beside the point. Okay, and the two classic examples of this Never Invade Russia in the winter that are always kind of thrown out there in the historical narrative are the first one being Napoleon in 1812 with his grand army of over 600,000 men invading Russia. Now, Napoleon invaded Russia, but before he did that, he was laying waste to all the other armies of Europe, creating a huge, expansive empire, essentially. And his plan when he got to Russia was to invade in June. Okay, so a lot of people think that Napoleon invaded in winter, and that's why he lost. Well, his plan was he was going to invade in June. He'd mop up the Russians and maybe two, three, four months, and then he'd head home in time for Christmas. Now, of course, that didn't happen. The Russians refused to meet him in battle. They continued retreating, using scorched earth policies, and ultimately Napoleon's army uh, succumbed to what's known in Russia as General Winter. And the army froze, starved, and had to retreat because they weren't prepared for the winter elements. At least that's what the uh, traditional historical narrative is. And, of course, the other never-invade-Russia-in-winter story that you're going to get is Hitler during World War II. So he decided to invade Russia in June of 1941. And, of course, what happens for Hitler is he has some initial success. His plan is to kind of wipe out Russia quickly, just like he wiped out France quickly and kind of use his blitzkrieg tactics and strategies. And, of course, Russia was able to hold out for longer, and winter hits, and all of a sudden this slows down the German tanks, the German mobility, the German speed, and one thing leads to another. All of a sudden, we're a year and a half or two years later at the Battle of Stalingrad, and the Russians have turned the tide. So these are the two typical historical narratives that you hear When you hear that phrase, never invade Russia in the winter, Napoleon and Hitler. And again, obviously the dynamics of both invasions were a lot more complicated than that. But nonetheless, that's the story you're going to get, at least in the traditional kind of layman's high school history 101. Never invade Russia in the winter, right? Now, what if I told you there was an army that not only invaded Russia in the winter, but intentionally invaded Russia in the winter. They weren't waiting, or they weren't starting the invasion in June and then getting bogged down. No, they intentionally invaded in winter. And not only did they completely destroy the Russians, but they also set the tone for hundreds and hundreds of years of brutal uh, autocratic regimes in Russia. That army that invaded Russia in the mid-1200s and did it in the winter, and did it relatively easily, of course, was the Mongols. So just a little bit.
bit of background on the Mongols before we get into their winter invasion of Russia. The Mongols were far and away one of the greatest militaries of all time. So that being the case, that also comes at a cost or a benefit, depending on your perspective, I guess. But the cost of that is brutality in this case. So if you look in history at some of the greatest militaries ever, okay, ancient Sparta, you know, the Mongols, the Assyrians, Nazi Germany, okay, a lot of these great militaries are also pretty brutal places to live in from a societal perspective. So I'm not sure I'd want to live in any of these empires or territories that, you know, these impressive militaries come from. Uh, particularly not the Mongols, and we'll see why in a second. So, of course, the Mongols were uh, horse archers, which means that they fought all their battles on horseback for the most part. So they would organize themselves into armies of about 10,000 men, and all of them would be on horseback. They'd all have bow and arrow. They'd have a light cavalry and a heavy cavalry. So typically the light cavalry would swoop down, harass the enemy, fire arrows into their formations. All of a sudden, those enemy formations start breaking up under heavy fire, and then the light cavalry moves aside, and the heavy cavalry sweeps in and delivers a crushing blow. Now, that was just one technique the Mongols used, but they would also do what's called a feigned retreat, where that light cavalry, or at least a small section of it, would uh, fight the enemy for a little while and then pretend like they were losing and retreating. Of course, the enemy would want to follow and try and finish the battle with a slaughter, and that cavalry would lead the opposing army directly into a trap where the rest of the army was, and then it would be another easy win for the Mongols. So the Mongols used all kinds of different techniques and strategies, but they were always on horseback. They were always incredibly mobile, able to move from place to place incredibly quickly. They were able to use the element of surprise to their advantage, and they were able to divide their army and move in multiple columns, even across hundreds and hundreds of miles of distance. So it was an incredibly modern army in terms of logistics and communications and supply lines and all the stuff like that that makes an army great. But what really makes the Mongol army impressive for me is that, well, impressive, but effective might be the better word. What really makes them effective is two things. It's their brutality, and it's their understanding of human psychology. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Essentially, the Mongols were playing chess, and every other army that they encountered was playing checkers. It's really that simple. So I've looked at a lot of ancient battles and, you know, looked at the diagrams and the reenactments and all that kind of stuff, and a lot of these ancient battles, whether it's Alexander the Great or some of the you know Persian Wars or stuff like that, these battles are not complicated. Typically, an ancient battle, one side would line up against the other, and both sides would charge, or one side would charge the other, and the losing side would retreat, and that would be it. Okay, occasionally, you'd have a you know flanking maneuver. Or one side of the army trying to sweep around or do some sort of side sweep or something like that. But by and large, these these battles, I'm always just shocked at how simple and basic these things are. Now, of course, you have some great generals doing some crazy tactics like your Hannibals or your Caesars, but by and large, these ancient battles are pretty simple. Both sides line up, let's fight. Okay, that's not the case with the Mongols. I'm going to tell a bit of a story here that's going to seem wildly off topic, but I hope it illustrates the point. So in high school, a buddy of mine, we were pretty athletic, you know, typical kids who played sports, but the girls' volleyball team at our school was incredible. Okay, they went to the state tournament, you know, all kinds of scholarships, stuff like that. Very good players. So one day, we find ourselves at the beach, Okay, we challenged two of these girls to a beach volleyball, two-on-two, kind of same style of thing that you might see in the Olympics. 
Okay, maybe that's why I'm thinking about this story because I'm watching the Olympics now. But So, of course, we think we have the advantage because we're dudes and we're athletic and we're in high school and we think we know everything. So we challenge them and we just get destroyed. I mean, it wasn't even close. We got annihilated. So to me, the Mongols during this time period against everyone else is kind of like my buddy and I from high school randomly on the beach challenging uh, you know, Misty May trainer, whoever the gold medal beach volleyball players are. Okay, we would just get destroyed. They would have better strategy, they would have better discipline, they would have better technique, and they would have more skill. It's just that simple. That's why the Mongols were better than everyone else. They were just better. So again, the two factors I'm going to focus on are the brutality and the Mongols' sophisticated understanding of human psychology. So let me give, me, let me give you some examples of that human psychology element that they understood. So there were times that the Mongols would, you know, they armies march over long distances and they camp at night. So the Mongol generals would order their soldiers to, to a man, create five camp pi- campfires for every soldier. So they'd have five fires for every soldier. And the enemy armies who would see this at night, they would see five times the amount of fires that they should have seen. Okay, so this would intimidate them, and this would make them think that the numbers were greater than they were. Okay, in a similar vein, Mongol armies would march, and each Mongol soldier had three extra horses. Or maybe it was three total horses. But nonetheless, each Mongol soldier had three horses. So you would ride one, and then when that one got tired, you would use your remount, uh, and you would that horse would be fresh. So the generals would order soldiers at times to put straw dummies on top of the horses that weren't being used to inflate the size of the army by three times. So you could have an army of 10,000 men marching, but from you know a distance that a scout might be looking at, it looks like a 30,000 man army. So this might not seem like anything but just you know smoke and mirrors and tricks, but they would use this at strategic times to get the enemy to react in certain ways. So get the enemy to think a big army's coming their way, and then you sneak an army around the back, and all of a sudden you're able to flank them and put them in a position that you can control. So the Mongols understood numbers and intimidation. Going along with that idea of the Mongols understanding numbers, sometimes they would inflate their own numbers in their army by recruiting people that they captured from local cities and towns. So there would be certain towns or cities that the Mongols would roll through and maybe due to a slight or maybe just due to trying to send a message, the Mongols would just wipe everybody out. A lot of the times they would use the people in the cities and towns that they captured. If anyone was good with engineering or building or logistics or intelligence or anything like that, the Mongols would impress them into the army and they would use them. If they weren't talented at anything like that, then a lot of the times the Mongols would give them a choice. Choice number one, we can kill you right now. Or choice number two, you can fight for our army and basically be, you know, cannon fodder at the front of it. So they could get thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of men to fight in the front lines and basically use them as kind of, you know, experimental tactics. You know, for example, in World War I, there was a lot of experimenting going on between both sides of the battle, you know, with tanks and airplanes and submarines and all these new weapons and technologies, generals didn't quite know how to use them. What's that, a tank? All right, let's throw it out there, see what happens. Okay, when you read about World War I, it seems like this happened more often than not. Now, the Mongols were able to do the same thing, but they didn't do it with their own troops. They were able to do that with the troops that they captured and were somehow able to motivate to fight for them. And, of course, again, as far as intimidation, the Mongols could use all sorts of weapons. Okay, They learned how to launch, essentially, bombs from China, so they would get these bamboo sticks, fill them with gunpowder, presumably from China, 
and they would launch it into towns, it wouldn't do a ton of damage, but it sure would intimidate the opponents, get them to start second-guessing how strongly they want to defend the city. I mean, imagine being in Russia in the winter of, I don't know, 12, 30, whatever, and all of a sudden there's a exploding stick of bamboo going off a couple meters from you. Okay, that's crazy. That's insane. And maybe from a less violent perspective, but a similar idea, there were stories of the Mongols running into Italian or Venetian merchants along the Mediterranean Sea or perhaps even further in closer to Asia. And, you know, instead of just killing everybody, which most people assume is what the Mongols did, they actually struck deals. So we'll give you exclusive access to trading rights in our huge empire. You guys go ahead and give us some intel on Europe. Give us some intel on Russia. What's going on? What are the local rivalries? What kind of armies are they able to field? So the Mongols were able to strike deals. They were also able to send agents into enemy territory to spread rumors and propaganda. Okay, A lot of times the Mongols would try and capitalize on people who weren't united against them. The Mongols would kill everyone in a city and maybe the next city over they would leave everyone in place. And what this does is it divides the next city that you're going to come upon. If you just killed everybody in city after city, then you would have to defend yourself. But now all of a sudden, you have a city where maybe half the people are arguing that, hey, they spared that one city, maybe they'll spare us. While the other half is saying, hey, they killed everyone in that city, maybe they'll kill us. And instead of presenting a united front against the Mongols, you have friction and factions developing. And the Mongols are able to capitalize using diplomacy and other weapons. I think it's clear that the Mongols understood human psychology, and they were able to use that in a military sense. Okay, so they were able to convert a kind of social phenomenon into a military advantage, and that's something the Mongols were probably the best at, was using political and social and economic advantages to aid their military. Now, that being said, the other element of it that I talked about was just the brutality. So, uh, here's Richard A. Gabriel, a historian who writes a lot about the Mongols and who I have taken a lot of stuff from in this podcast. He's quoting a a historian in his book here. uh, His book's called Subutai the Valiant. Subutai being one of the great Mongol generals we're going to talk about, but Here's what he says about Mongol brutality, quote, As one historian put it, more lives were lost probably than in any similar conflict of such duration, a mere three years. The cold and deliberate genocide practiced by the Mongols has no parallel save that of the, the ancient Assyrians and the modern Nazis, end quote. So he's talking about the war, Mongol war with uh, the Muslim Khwarezmian Empire led by the Khwarezmian Shah, And that battle, he's saying, was as brutal and deadly as maybe anything in world history. And guess what? That's a small fraction of the wars that the Mongols were launching. Many of these wars at the same exact time, which is ridiculous. They were in China. They were in the Middle East. They were in Europe. And they were brutal everywhere they went. I'm just going to tell one story that kind of just typifies the Mongol experience and the Mongol brutality. So I forget which city it was. I believe it was a a city in China as the Mongols were just beginning their Chinese conquests. And they were holding out pretty well against the Mongols. They had big walls. They had a moat. So the Mongols didn't quite know how to do this. Remember, they came from the Central Asian steppe, so they had never, never seen big walls. They had never seen huge rivers. They had never seen, you know, castles and moats, things of that nature before, so they didn't quite know how to deal with that at first. Of course, later on, they would, you know, incorporate engineers into the army and siege craft and ladders and all that stuff, but at least in this particular encounter, Genghis Khan, leader of the Mongols, took a different strategy. He went into the city and he said, or, you know, he went up to the city walls and he said, look, If you give us a 1,000 cats and 10,000 birds, we'll leave your city alone. We'll just move on to the next one. We'll never come back. 
And, of course, the leaders of the city probably thought to themselves, you know, what the heck is this guy talking about? What does he want with cats and birds? So they say, okay, we'll give you the birds. We'll give you the cats. Just leave us the heck alone. Stop trying to kill us. Stop stop assaulting our, our walls here. So Genghis Khan gets the cats and the birds, and he proceeds to light the birds on fire and light the cats on fire and release them from their cages. And for some reason, when a bird is lit on fire, it's going to go into panic mode and it's going to fly right back to its nest, which is right in the city. So you have these flying birds on fire along with these crazy flaming cats running into the city, uh, creating huge fires. And amidst that you know, distraction of the city blowing up, essentially, the Mongols were able to storm the walls and take the city. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. That seems a bit ridiculous to me, but honestly, when you put that next to some of the brutality and the craziness that the Mongols uh, were taking part in during this time period, I don't even blink an eye. Honestly, that could have happened. Who knows? But it just shows how not only brutal the Mongols were, but smart and willing to use anything in their repertoire to win. Okay, no stone unturned. So now that we have some background on the Mongols, we can start talking about the attack on Russia. So Genghis Khan was, of course, the leader of the Mongols, one of the most, you know, either celebrated or infamous rulers of all time. And they're going to take out northern China first. They're going to sweep into Central Asia and the Middle East. They're going to just destroy the empire there, the Khorizmian Empire. And then Genghis Khan is going to turn his attention to the West. He's heard stories, but he's never seen it. And what he does is he goes to his most trusted general, okay, a guy by the name of Subutai the Valiant. And Subutai has orders to take 30,000 men, and go on a scouting mission through the Caucasus Mountains. And they're going to go through that mountain range into Russia and then eventually into Western Europe, see what's there, scout it out, and then come back. Let me know what's going on. Eventually we'll make our make our attempt to take it over, presumably. So that was Subutai's mission. It was just a scouting mission. He takes 30,000 men, and they head out. So who was the Subutai guy? Well, essentially, he was Genghis Khan's tent door watch guy. So as Genghis Khan was kind of rising in the ranks and becoming more powerful and adding tribes to his increasing list of subjects, Subutai was the guy who was always at his tent door providing protection. And it seems that Subutai often got to sit in or maybe even stand in on a lot of the meetings that Genghis Khan was having. So those military meetings he was having with his generals in the early days when the Mongols were consolidating power, Subutai was watching and listening and becoming more and more smart and more and more valuable as far as a military mind. So at some point, Genghis Khan recognizes that, hey, this isn't just a uh, you know tent door watch guy. This guy can be a significant force and a important factor in what we're doing. So eventually Genghis Khan makes him a general and over time Subutai becomes his most trusted general. So back to the scouting mission. Subutai has about 30,000 men. They go through the Caucasus Mountains and the first thing they do is they meet a group of people called the Georgians. And it's actually a, a tight battle and a tough battle. Um, I'm not going to go into that here. But the Mongols essentially get through the Georgians, they conquer them, and then they conquer a group of people called the Cumans. So the Cumans are a nomadic horse archer people, just like the Mongols, and they have, you know, the, the border of Russia to the east is filled with these Cuman peoples. So the Mongols are able to defeat them as well, and then the path to Russia is open. And what happens is that the Cumans, okay, fleeing the Mongols, they go into Russia and they essentially ask for help. 
So the way Russia is organized at the time, it's kind of like a feudal society. So there's a lot of different princes and a lot of different areas that are under control of different people. So it's not a united Russia like we think of today. It's more of a different feudal societies that are kind of feuding with each other. In fact, I think it was like there was more than 40 civil wars uh, in just a couple of years prior to the Mongols showing up. So Russia was a divided country, and each of these princes in Russia had a different uh, area that they controlled. So nonetheless, the Cumans come into Russia. They ask for help. A guy by the name of Mitislav the Daring, he's one of the primary Russian princes who has some of the most power. He's able to round up a huge army, and they start getting to getting ready to meet the Mongols. So, of course, the Mongols recognize this, and they send in their diplomats. So a lot of times the Mongols would actually try diplomacy, even if they didn't intend to fill out the obligations, if they could use diplomacy in any way to their advantage, they were going to do it. The Mongols would send their diplomats into Russia, and the Russians killed the diplomats, had them executed. And this was, of course, a faux pas in kind of ancient society. You didn't kill diplomats. That was considered, obviously, an act of war. And if you're killing diplomats, then you can't have diplomats because what's the point if they're just going to be killed? So this turns out to be just an epic mistake. I would not provoke the Mongols or mess with the Mongols in any way that's not absolutely necessary. Of course, the Russians just had no idea who these Mongol peoples were, but... Uh, That's beside the point. So the Mongols send a second group of diplomats in, and here's what they say according to the Chronicle of Novgorod, which is a Russian source. Quote, Since you have not listened and have killed all our envoys and are coming against us, come then, but we have not touched you. Let God judge all. End quote. So what you see there is the Mongols are basically saying, hey, we didn't do this to you. You're the ones that killed our diplomats, so if you want to fight us, bring it on. But, you know, don't blame us for what we end up doing to you because it's going to be bad. And when you take off the Mongols, bad things tend to happen. So our Russian friend, Mitislav the Daring, is able to muster about 80,000 troops, and the Mongols have about 20,000. And the Mongols kind of lure the Russians into a place where they can do battle. And of course, the Russians wanting to, you know, defeat the Mongols, they go there. Now, what ends up happening during the battle is that the Mongols leave a kind of rear guard of about a thousand men, and they take the rest of their army and they just slowly retreat. And the Russians kind of sensing weakness or sensing a Mongol retreat, and also wanting to have glory and all that stuff that armies are looking for, they chase after the Mongols. So they slaughter the Mongol rear guard. Okay, they slaughter the thousand men. And they're looking for more, so they continue to pursue and try and kill the Mongols who are fleeing. Now, this is something the Mongols knew were, was going to happen. Okay, they had received intelligence reports, things of that nature, so they knew this was going to happen. A lot of time, these European feudal armies were kind of hodgepodge collections of different peoples from different areas. So they had loyalty to their feudal lords, but they didn't necessarily have any unity or discipline or anything like that because they didn't have a lot of time to train together as a full unit, as a full army. And plus, each individual knight was looking for kind of his own glory. So the Mongols knew this was going to happen, and the Russians are slowly chasing the Mongols through these mountains. And as the Mongols are retreating... The Russians are becoming more and more tired. They're not used to this terrain. Okay, Subutai had scoped it out specifically for this purpose. And they're actually getting out of formation, the Russians are. So as the Russians finally catch the Mongols, some of their units are days even more behind. So finally, the Mongols turn around. It's it's at the uh, Kalka River. Okay, this is called the Battle of the Kalka River. So the Mongols face up backs to the river, and they finally face this Russian army that's slowly moving towards them. And of course, the Mongols attack in their typical style, where the light cavalry comes down, they harass the enemy with arrows, 
the Mongols actually launched these black smoke pots to disorient the enemy. And all of a sudden, the Russians aren't prepared, they're not formed up in their lines, and the initial troops are getting routed. Okay, so the light cavalry sweeps aside, and the heavy cavalry comes in and slams into the Russian forces. They start retreating. The Russians are moving back. They're actually slamming into the troops that are still trying to get to the battle. Remember those troops that were late because the army got all disorganized, and those troops are slamming into the new troops. It's chaos, it's destruction, and all of a sudden we have a Mongol rout on our hands. In the midst of all this confusion and chaos, the Mongols would slaughter that 80,000-man army to a man. So you have a 20,000-man Mongol army essentially completely wiping out the biggest force that Russia could muster at the time. And remember, this is just a scouting uh, expedition by Subutai. So this is not, of course, the full Mongol army, which is fighting in the Middle East, fighting in China. So once the slaughter was done and the Mongols were wrapping things up, they captured the Prince of Kiev, who was one of the people in charge of these Russian armies and probably the person responsible for killing those Mongol diplomats, those Mongol ambassadors. And I'll let Richard Gabriel describe what happens to this prince of Kiev. Quote, For the murder of the Mongol ambassadors, the prince of Kiev was suffocated to death inside a box. Mongol tradition forbade the shedding of royal blood except in battle. All princes, Mongol or otherwise, according to Mongol law, were to either be strangled or suffocated. End quote. So the Mongols didn't forget those diplomats that got slaughtered. They also didn't forget that rear guard that they left behind at the Battle of the Kalka River that was slaughtered, and the Mongols always pay an eye for an eye. Once that's done, the Mongols, of course being the Mongols, began to ravage the Russian countryside, plunder, take what they want, burn cities, typical Mongol behavior. And it's time actually to turn back. It's time to go back, report to Genghis Khan, everything that's happened. So Subutai leaves behind a bunch of spies, a bunch of informants, uh, to again, sow chaos inside of Russia and report back any vital information because the next time the Mongols come back, it's going to be with a huge army and a force that's ready to take over all of Russia and all of Western Europe. In 1227, Genghis Khan dies. Uh, his son, Ogadai takes over. And it takes a while for the Mongol machine to kind of warm up again and get ready. So it's not for another 10 years before that Mongol army that's ready to go conquer Russia and go conquer Western Europe is able to get under its feet and start moving. So in 1237, the Mongols are now officially fighting in China. They're fighting in Korea. They're fighting in Persia. And they're going to send a huge army into Russia. So we already saw what they did with just a scouting force. Now we're going to see what they can do with an entire Mongol army. This time, Subutai is in charge of about 150,000 men. And he heads into Russia around 1236, 1237. And what he realizes is that Russia is just a mess at this time. So I think I mentioned earlier all the civil wars. I think the official number is 80 plus civil wars happened between 1054 and 1224. And that is not including 40 plus invasions okay, by groups like the Cumans, the Bulgars. Um, so the 150 or 200 years before this in Russian history were filled with turmoil, okay? And that kind of shows maybe why the feudal society is struggling to unite and they're struggling to put forward a common message and a common, you know, force against the Mongol armies. When you add this to the harsh climate conditions in Russia that we all know about, okay, remember General Winter, when you add this to the fact that there's no roads, really, in Russia at this time, um, in spring and fall, the roads are too muddy, in winter, everything's frozen over, but there's real, you know, there's no paving or anything like that. So it's difficult to get transportation around. When you add to the fact that there's marshes, 
There's um, all sorts of harsh conditions and, you know, stuff going on in Russia that makes it difficult to unite as a force. And we've talked about how, you know, future invasions of Russia in the winter would not go well. Okay, Hitler and Napoleon invaded in June. They waited too long. It turned into winter. They weren't prepared for it. And things went downhill from there. Well, the Mongol strategy is actually the complete opposite. Their strategy was to invade during the winter. Okay, during the winter of 1236 and 1237. Why would they invade in winter? Well, if all the rivers are frozen over, the marshes are going to be frozen over, and their horses are incredibly mobile, and they're excellent riders. So they're able to cross rivers now. They're able to maneuver much, much better than the Russians. So they might not be maneuvering at you know, full capacity, but their ability to maneuver is going to be greater than the Russians, and that's going to give them an advantage. So the Mongols decide we're going to invade in the winter because we actually have some advantages in this scenario. So Subutai kind of has a four-step plan. So step one occurs in 1236 and 1237, and that step is basically to neutralize those nomadic horse peoples to the east of Russia. So remember we talked about the Cumans and groups like that. The Mongols are going to neutralize them, defeat them relatively easily. And instead of killing them all, they're actually going to add them into the army. So we talked about how the Mongols would add in you know, prisoners or people they captured into their army. So now all of a sudden, they add 50,000 of these horse archer peoples into their army. And all of a sudden, the army swells to a size of about 200,000 people. And it's bearing down on Russia. Step two of Subutai's plan was to isolate the northern part of Russia from the south part. So based on his informants and his spies, he understood that if he could separate north and south, then those feudal princes in the south and in the north wouldn't be able to unite with each other, and it was going to work to the Mongol advantage. So at first, the Mongols attacked the north, and this was consistent with the Mongol strategy. They would burn cities to the ground, sack them, and try and lure armies out into the open. One of these cities is a place called Riazan. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that right or not, but here's a chronicler from the time reporting what happens there. Quote, no eyes remained open to weep for the dead. End quote. So the slaughter and the destruction at Riazan was so thorough that nobody was left alive. And the Mongols were doing this in city after city, town after town in northern Russia. This, of course, musters the Russian army finally. The Mongols surround them easily and destroy them. That's step three of the plan. And then step four was to march on Kiev, which was kind of the main Russian seat of power, the city of Kiev, and essentially burn it to the ground. Here's Richard Gabriel describing that destruction. Quote, The destruction was so great that when a traveler passed by the ruins of the city six years later, he described it as having only a few hundred huts, with the ground still littered with countless skulls and bones of dead men. End quote. So people were coming by Kiev six years later, and the, the pile of bones and, you know, the rubble from that slaughter at Kiev was so great that it was still there six years later. So the Mongols now had Russia completely under their control, and they set up their kind of local governments and things like that, and Mongols, Mongol rule would actually continue in Russia for a couple hundred years. And a lot of people think that the kind of autocratic systems we see in later Russian history are actually a result of some of this Mongol influence. And it's, it's easy to see once you understand the Mongols. Now, the Mongols would continue into Poland. They would continue into Hungary. And they would conquer those peoples. That's a story for another time. And they were bearing down on Western Europe, getting ready to uh, completely annihilate it, in my opinion. Remember, the Mongols here were playing chess. Okay, they were instituting modern warfare. They had 
speed. They had intelligence networks. They were using spies. They were using human psychology to sow discord. They had better fighters. They were more mobile. They were able to adapt to their circumstances better. And overall, again, they were just playing chess and everyone else was playing checkers. This army was in many ways unstoppable and it it shows. What ultimately saves Western Europe is, of course, the Great Khan dying. And it's Mongol custom when the Great Khan dies. You have to go back to you know the Mongol homeland, do this big ritual thing, elect a new Khan. And the Mongols were never the same, and they never really looked at Western Europe as something they wanted to pursue. But in my opinion, at least Subutai would have gotten the job done in Western Europe if he had to. And who knows how civilization might have changed, or at least Western civilization might have changed due to that. I mean, that's a that's a great what if in history, is what if the Mongols conquered Western Europe? Does the Enlightenment happen? Does the scientific revolution happen? Does the age of exploration happen? I don't know. It's impossible to say. So just to wrap up here, the Mongols, the way I like to think about it here is that they essentially conquered three completely separate civilizations. So a lot of people like to think of history as, you know, these different civilizations kind of clashing with each other. And, you know, sometimes they get along, sometimes they clash. There's the, you know, the Chinese civilization, there's the Middle Eastern civilization, there's the European civilization, there's, you know, all these different civilizations that sometimes come into contact with each other. And whether that's, you know, Christianity associated with Europe, Islam associated with the Middle East, okay, the Eastern religions, however you want to group it, the Mongols essentially conquered three entire civilizations at the same time. So they conquered China, they conquered the Islamic civilizations, and they conquered the Christian, or at least a large portion of the Christian civilizations at the same time. Okay, that's insane. And that shows you the Mongols, they were going up against different types of armies, different social kind of customs, and they were using everything to their advantage, and they were able to completely subdue three entirely separate civilizations. So the next time you see that meme or that t-shirt that says, friends don't let friends invade Russia in the winter, that's fine, but make sure you add on an extra little tidbit to the end of it. Never invade Russia in the winter, unless you're the Mongols. If you like this episode of the podcast, or any of the previous episodes, you can leave a rating or review on whatever platform you're listening to it on. I'm told this helps spread the podcast to people who might be interested in listening to it somehow. So that would be fantastic if you could do that. If you didn't like the episode, you can leave me an angry tweet and we can talk about why it was terrible. Ultimately, I'm just glad you're out there listening. So that being said, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.